I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar speaker series provided by the PA Care Partnership in association with the Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, uh, OMSOS. Um, if you have any questions for our presenter during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A feature, which you will find by running your mouse along the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we will get to as many of your questions as we can after the presentation. Uh, today's moderators are Nancy Massey and myself, Jamal Ford, and we will be monitoring the chat and Q&A. Uh, today's speaker is Reverend Yes, my canon of missions with the Episcopal Diocese of Pennsylvania. She has a Master of Health Science from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Social Work from Westchester University. Reverend Smythe has almost 20 years of experience working in social work, services for the homeless, veterans, housing services, residential services, and community behavioral health services. It is now my pleasure to welcome Reverend Smythe. Thank you, Jamal, for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. First, thank you, Nancy, for this wonderful invitation to come speak here today in PA Cares uh, Partnership to speak about a topic that's near and dear to my heart and about a population that's near and dear to my heart. And thank you, Jamal, also for your patience and for the help that you've given me in the past couple of days. Before I get started, I just want to give you a little bit more background to um, share my experience and why I'm here today. I am a licensed social worker. I have a lot of my experience and education as working with veterans, particularly homeless veterans. So going into shelters, talking to veterans about um, their benefits and connecting with housing, working in transitional housing, helping veterans go to that next step of independent living. And I've also conducted IRB research related to homelessness against uh, amongst veterans, um, the topic being psychosocial and faith-based faith -based factors. I'm the canon for mission for the, for the Episcopal Diocese of Pennsylvania. So basically what that means is my job is not only to work with parishes and help them create ministries that cater to the needs of the community, but my job is to help the diocese partner with entities in the community, nonprofits that are working towards the same goals that we are. Things like poverty, racism, mental health issues, addiction, um, human trafficking, all of those things. Um, with the point being that we tend to work in silos, churches, but if we're working towards the same goals, let's all sit at the table together and figure it out together. One of our uh, near and dear partners that we have is the Michael J. Crescent's uh, VA Medical Center in Philly, which is a lot of the content today is gonna come from that relationship. Um, they provided these community clergy trainings for us, which has been extremely, extremely um, helpful and beneficial. Um, and the reason that it's important is because amongst veterans, it's known that religious leaders are often the first people that they turn to for help, especially in rural areas. So we wanna make sure as clergy that we are equipped to provide the best pastoral care for them, especially considering the suicidal rate. Um, according to the 2020 annual report, the average veteran suicide is 18 per day. That means just about almost every hour that passes by, there is at least one veteran that has taken their life. So if we can do anything to prevent that, let's do it. By the end of this training, not only um, I hope that you learn about moral injury, what it is and how to prevent it, but also to see faith-based leaders as an ally and a part of the treatment team, to be a part of the team in addressing social justice and, and disparity gaps in the community. So this is just an overview for today. Um, I am gonna, the topic is mostly veterans, but I want everyone to know that moral injury is just not limited to the military. There are people outside civilians that can definitely, definitely experience moral injury. Anywhere there's a transgression against your moral compass occurs, you can experience moral injury. And I'll explain that a little later in the, in the discussion today. The first thing that we wanna discuss is the basics. And it's gonna seem simple, but it's really important for everyone to understand the differences between the physical wound and then the wounds that we can't see, the ones that are invisible. So just to start, the basics is defining what, what injury and, and wounds are. This is per the dictionary. So injury is a hurt, damage, or loss sustained, a violation to another's rights for which the law allows an action to recover damages. While a wound, almost somewhat, somewhat similar, is a mental or emotional hurt or blow, an injury to the body. 
So these are some of the common wounds that we experience, PTSD, traumatic uh, brain injury, moral injury, Agent Orange. If there's anyone here that doesn't know what Agent Orange is, it's essentially, it was a chemical used back in the Vietnam era as a way to control vegetation, but the chemicals have caused side effects with those that were around it, like, um, like diseases, cancer, and it even caused birth de uh, defects with children. MST, all of those things are different types of, obviously not all of them, but different types of wounds that we can experience. So I'm gonna focus on um, PTS and moral injury because the two of them are very much linked together um, just to help show the differences between them. So first we're gonna start with uh, PTSD or PTS. I'm gonna preface people that I'm not a medical doctor. So I hope there's no questions related to like how the brain functions, because I don't know. But I do know somewhat a little bit about PTSD in relation to what parts of the brain it affects. So PTSD, it affects the um, sensory input, the memory formation, um, stress response mechanisms. And the part of the brain that deals with memory um, is the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the frontal cortex. Now to get diagnosed with PTSD, there's a whole slew of criteria that needs to be checked off. I honestly am not going to read through all of these. There's about three pages of them. Um, this is per the, P, uh, the DSM-5. You should know that PTSD has been around for years and years and years before it was actually recognized and diagnosed as PTSD. It was not placed in the, or recognized as a disorder until about the night about the 80s, like 1980 or so. Here I highlighted guilt or shame. You don't have to memorize that right now, but just keep it in the back of your, back of your head as we talk about moral injury. Military culture. We're gonna start there. Um, it's important before as a social worker, a therapist, as a clergy, before you engage with veterans, just like any other um, culture, that you understand that culture and those norms. Because a lot of what we do and how we cope and react to things, it could be related to our religious connection and to our, our whatever country that we're from. The same applies to the military. We need to understand the cultural norms to avoid enforcing our own norms on veterans, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on military culture just so you understand it, like a brief um, crash course on it. This is the social contract. You're gonna hear this phrase a lot throughout this discussion. The social contract, there's three elements or bodies, I should say. It's us, the civilians, the military, and then our representatives. This social contract, it imparts obligations on all three parties. At the center of it is the word trust. So you have civilians, um, military uh, service members that come from the civilian population. And as they become military um, personnel, they take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. The civilians, we also elect our elect representatives, including our commander in chief. The commander in chief that we elect, ultimately the military takes their orders in terms of who we go to war with. So there's that just circle of trust, and I want to emphasize that. So as we begin the discussion, it's important to remember this social contract as we begin to talk about the values and missions for various military branches. It's important to remember this social contract as we begin to talk about society ideals versus reality. And lastly, it's important to remember this social contract as we begin to talk about transitioning from saying, thank you for your service to welcome home. So please remember the social contract, it'll come back up. I wanna talk or show this brief um, clip for you. It's an actual soldier, he's in the army, I believe, and he depicts very well as we talk about the mental, spiritual, and emotional transition that happens when people move from the civilian population to the military and the culture, the military culture that follows with that. I'm not gonna play the whole thing, um, but just a portion of it. Airplanes are interesting. 
It's one of the few places in the world where you can sit for 90 minutes and talk to a complete stranger who's willing to tell you their deepest, darkest, most intimate secrets. Now, the funny thing is that I am in the secret keeping business. A few years ago, I was on a flight to Little Rock to talk to a group of soldiers who were about to deploy into combat. And I was sitting next to a gentleman who was interested in the fact that I worked for the Department of Defense. And so he told me a story about his best friend, Jason. Now, Jason was an amazing saxophone player. He could have started his own band. He probably could have played in the symphony orchestra. He could have gone to Juilliard. But in his senior year, people were asking him, what are you going to do? And Jason, with pride, held his head high, and stuck his chest out, and said, I've received a distinguished honor. I'm going to play in the Marine Corps band. As graduation came, the war in Iraq broke out. And when Jason went to Iraq, they didn't send him with his saxophone. He was manning a 50 caliber machine gun atop a Humvee. And as they were doing route clearance, the first person that came running out of a ditch with a gun was a little boy. And Jason said, I don't want to kill no kid. And his fellow Marines said, take him out. So he looked back down into the Humvee and he said it again. I don't want to kill no kid. And they said, Marine, do what you were trained to do. And I'll end this story by saying that every night when Jason goes to sleep, the face that he sees is the face of that little boy. So I want a little audience participation today. I need to breathe. The question that I want to ask you is, what do you think the correlation is between deployment or going to combat a war? What's the correlation between deployment and suicide? Your options are going to be there's a high correlation, there's a medium correlation, or there's a low correlation. I want everybody to participate. How many people think, thinking about that story of Jason, that there's a high correlation between deployment and suicide? And how many of you think that there is a medium correlation between deployment and suicide? And then how many of you think that there is a low correlation between deployment and suicide? Okay. So most of you believe that there is a high correlation between deployment and suicide. So the first thing that I want to teach you is that there is no correlation between deployment and suicide. What that means simply is that there are just as many soldiers who die by suicide who have deployed or gone into war as those soldiers who have never gone into war. And there's a reason for this. And shortly, I'll tell you the reason why. Today, I want to talk to you about why men should be allowed to cry why soldiers should be allowed to talk and pain 
should be allowed to be shared. Okay. I'm going to stop it there. So Richard Doss continues in the, in the end of this, of this video. So he talks about the pain that veterans, specifically soldiers, which is related to, to the army carry, and that how service member soldiers are not good about asking for help. Just as they wear camouflage um, to hide themselves in plain sight, they walk around in plain sight hiding their grief, their shame, their guilt, their emotions, their pain. And us as society, we don't really do a good job of asking them how they're doing or for help because we see service members, soldiers as you know these strong individuals. But the fact is, is that they're not invincible. And so we have to do a better job of doing that, of asking them how they're doing. And a part of that, which we'll discuss a little bit later is, you know, that phrase from that movie, you can't handle the truth. I forgot what the movie was. But the fact of the matter is we don't want to know the truth. And I'll talk about that, it's called moral disengagement a little later. So as we talk about moral, um, about the transition, we have to start with the basic training. This is where the civilians turn into military warriors, where the mental, the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual transformation happens. Um, this is an eight to 13 week process where you learn about how to move, communicate, how to survive, how to food ration, sleep deprivation. You do rigorous day and nighttime um, marches, you learn about team dependency, negotiation obstacles, team field fire and combat scenarios, all of those things. But no matter what branch of military that you're from, at the center of that, there's always that sense of being a part of a one body, of being a part of a family. So let's start with the first transformation, which is the mental transformation. This also applies to, to females, and we'll talk about that later too, is the sense of even if you're a female, you're a warrior first and you're a female second. It's that transitioning of that mental, mental um, note. So we're all raised in various families with our own norms and way of being, whether it's healthy or not. But then we go into this basic training and you're doing this transformation to your new military family. You have to leave that behind to adopt to these new norms, these new values, these new rules that, that you need to abide by. And so I'm gonna share with you, these are actually from to the sites. This is one for the Army on their website. I can't get to all of the military branches, so if there's people in the Air Force or uh, Navy, I apologize. It's no offense. I only have an hour and a half or less than that. So mental transformation. I am an American soldier. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and live the Army values. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined, physically and mentally tough, trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and drills. So let's go to the physical transformation that happens. We all know this with the basic training, it's the fitness and endurance, you build strength and of course endurance. But then this is the part that relates to a lot of moral injury, the emotional transformation that happens. The bottom you'll see three masks. These, this is a project from the National Geographic um, project that they did. It's basically veterans created these masks to show how they see themselves versus how we see them. And so if you go to the page, I'm not gonna change because we had technical difficulties and I'm worried about switching pages. I'm just gonna stay on this. But if you go to the page, it shows you veterans in their house, you know, holding their babies, sitting in the kitchen, they're in their uniform or, you know, whatever they're wearing for the day. And their family members are just reacting to them as their, you know, normal dad, brother, whatever the case may be. But then they're wearing this mask. It's to signify that they no longer see themselves as society sees them themselves, this emotional transformation that happens. This is where the what was, what is, and what you need me to be are trying to battle in one body and live together. This is the website if you want to check it out. Um, please do on National Geographic. So let's talk about emotional cycle of deployment, which is extremely important, important uh, especially with emotional transformation. You have the anticipation of departure, you know, preparing yourself for loss. And then you have the, de the detachment. You're trying to ease yourself from pain so you're emotionally detached. And then the emotional disorganization when the training starts, when you're trying to adapt to these new norms that are created from your family norms. The stabilizations, getting comfy with those new norms and values. And then 
going back to the anticipation of return. You're a little bit nervous, but you're excited as well. But you should remember as the, the service member returns back home, life has continued, right? You can't stop. So your roles and functions, they had to continue. So they've been reassigned. So now you have the service member trying to reintegrate into the household and the role and function has changed. It's essentially no longer needed. And so they tried to reintegrate and take back some of those family roles that they had and stabilize them back into the normal, um, the norms that were. But then the cycle continues all over again. So you can see how that causes this emotional cycle that happens. And of course, the spiritual transformation, this internal conflict that happens. It's a battle with your conscience internally. And so you have where your, your norms of um, before the military and then your military norms are kind of at odds with one another. Thou shalt not kill, but I did. And then there's the forgiveness. Can I be forgiven for what I've done or, or were a part of? And then, of course, the question of where was God? How could he let this happen? How could he let me do this to so-and-so? How could he let this war happen? Questions that they are struggling with. The military culture, just to nail it home, you're going from um, you know, a value of integrity and honor, this tough physical uh, atmosphere of controlled aggressions. It's very authoritative. It's mission focused. It's task oriented and controlled emotions. Please remember that. And then you have these values and virtues that you have to go by commitment, courage, obedience, honor, integrity. This is from the Army. These are the rules of engagement um, and the last part of understanding military culture. I wanted to share this because sometimes moral injury can also come from. Um, when you go against your own new norms. So you have the norms before the military and then you have these rules that you follow. And then what happens if you have to engage in or you witness someone that has violated these rules? Components to, to trauma, I wanna emphasize, you veterans do not have to or um, have gone through combat to experience trauma. That's usually a misconceived notion is that, you know, to have trauma PTSD, you had to have gone through combat. That's not necessarily, and I'm gonna show you why. So there's two categories of trauma. There's the environmental one, which we all know for PTSD, natural disasters, but there's also the interpersonal ones, which we're gonna dive into deeply. Um, that's where the military sexual trauma comes from and domestic violence as well. So the second form of wound and injury that we're focused on and the star of this, this discussion is moral injury. It's about invisible wounds. It's a wound to your soul that happens. That's internal struggle. I wanna share this quote by C.S. Lewis that I love and I use often um, when discussing about moral injury. It says, the mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain, but it's more common and also harder to bear. So I love this one because let me give you an example. So as society, we react to what we see. So if you have someone that you know that had surgery, they had an amputation, they had surgery for something else, or maybe they're just like extremely ill in bed with the flu or something. Our reaction is, I see that you're in pain or you're suffering here. Here's some meals for the week. Here's some financial contributions to get you through until you feel better. Here are some cards for you. But how often do we provide these same comforts to people that say, I have depression or going through mental illness, things that we can't see, but they're carrying with them. Remember what Richard Daw said about veterans are very good at walking around in plain sight, carrying that sorrow, grief, and guilt and shame with them. So for moral injury, this conscious uh, internal battle that's happening with your, with your with your conscience. There's no over-the-counter drug for that. There's no script or um, card that you can give someone for moral injury. The fact is moral injury is not new. So even though it's gaining a lot more recognition over the past few years, it's been around even the, since the 3,000 uh, 3, years ago uh, with Homer's Iliad, there's references to what we know, now know as moral injury. So I'm not gonna read this, but um, this is just one. It said from a journal from 1951 that relates to um, 
what was observed with service member soldiers that were experiencing moral injury, what we know for moral injury. As far as the DSM, um, it wasn't until 2013 that shame and guilt were explicitly labeled within the DSM-5. So moral injury is not new. It's been around long before it was recognized, just like PTSD. There's a lot of definitions out there for moral injury, uh, but at the center of all of them is the, the core of having a transgression against your moral beliefs, an existential crisis that happens. But for the sake of this discussion, we're gonna go with, with this definition. It is um, events that are considered morally injurious if, if they transgress deeply, held moral beliefs and expectations. Thus the key precondition for moral injury is an act of transgression, which shatters moral and ethical expectations that are rooted in religious or spiritual beliefs or cultural based organizational and group based rules and fairness, the value of life and so forth. I'm gonna tell you, I read this definition during a female veterans retreat and there were three female veterans that started to get teary in their eyes. As they read this, they saw what they were experiencing but they could never put a label on it, which is powerful. Moral injury, it's a wound to your soul. It can shake the foundation of who you are. There's no pill to make someone feel that you can be forgiven or feel loved or um, to remove that shame and guilt that they feel when their moral beliefs have been trampled on. And it's important to know that moral injury is not a disorder. It's a response to your, your ethical compass being tampered with. It is not a disorder. We're gonna move from a, a disorder to a, um, a view of healing. So moral injury, I mentioned before, we're gonna talk about veterans, but anyone can have it. You see it with doctors when you see uh, physician fatigue, it doesn't necessarily mean physical fatigue. If you're in an environment dealing with um, the modern healthcare system and the ethical dilemmas that happen. Healthcare workers, therapists can experience moral dilemmas, first responders, even judges in the courtroom, the whole act of you know, racism playing out in the courtroom, those type of things. Anyone where there's a transgression, moral injury can occur. But we're gonna focus on, on veterans for this. Jamal and Nancy, let me know if I'm talking too fast. I'm trying to get as much out there. So these are some causes of what to get moral injury related to, to, to veterans, following orders, knowing that they were illegal, domestic violence, and what we're gonna talk about shortly, which is sexual assault and rape. The symptoms, the primary, always remember guilt and shame. There's the spiritual conflict, the existent, existential conflict. And from that is the secondary, there's the self-harm. Harm. We talked about suicide rate with veterans, anxiety, um, and social problems as well. Now there are some overlapping symptoms between PS PTSD and moral injury, um, but although PTSD includes guilt and shame, it doesn't mention moral or ethical suffering, which is extremely important for moral injury. And there's physical evidence too. There was a study in 2019 that showed that um, doing an MRI, there was a difference in brain activity, brain mechanisms between moral injury and PTSD. This is so important, the connection between PTSD and moral injury, the spiritual versus the clinical, that the VA in 2014 uh, created uh, the mental health integration for chaplain services. So it's basically where therapists and chaplains come together to try and address moral injury. And just like, um, a lot of things when there's trauma is if you don't have the coping skills, you would create maladaptive um, issues like substance abuse, isolation, avoidance issues, those type of things. And then there's the cognitive self-beliefs, the what stem from the guilt and the shame. I should have done more. I should have seen it coming. I don't know who I am anymore. And then the faith and spirituality, the existential crisis that happens, feeling that you're going to go to hell, that you're cursed, or that you won't be forgiven, or not even knowing what you believe anymore. Where was God in all of this? So I'm going to share with you, um, there is a female veteran that did experience MST military sexual trauma. And as a part of her, her work and healing, she does poems. So I'm not going to share it with you. Um, 
like passing it out, but I do want to read it to you. And it's explaining her trauma with MST and moral injury. It's called shadow wrestling. Wrestling with shadows from the carnivorous abyss of memory lane, the deep groan shriek, haunted, jolted, traumatized by the depressive gloom, overpowering and overwhelming the sensibility, jumping blindly in the dark, flailing about from the walls of each memory, contained in a safe place, under lock and key, only to be entangled in the intricacies of the fine lines of the brain freeways to the heart, of invisible silk strings, or the elaborate elastic spider's web. And trapped with the shadows, clobbered by fear, trying not to succumb to the deluge of anxiety that rides high, drowning all life. Scrambling to find higher ground, cutting, pushing, defending what little piece of my soul is left. Silence is golden, especially when the shrills from my heart ring loud in my ears. The body remembers, it will never forget, each battle scar that was carved into the skin of my memory will, with a dull knife. The body remembers each jagged edge word that chomped at the wound infecting it, making it blister, bubble, and bleed. My soul remembers the invisible wounds I carry that hurt the most keloid scars from memory lane that are wrapped around the chambers of this beating heart, extending octopi like tentacles to other vital organs. I've died this death a thousand times over, only to be resuscitated back to life to live again. I think that's very deep. So let's transition from that poem um, into talking about MST. So assault can lead to victims with a sense of being um, disconnected with their body that have moral injury. Um, it can result in a crisis of faith. So this all can make you feel unclean or feel like you're ugly. And from that sense, you know, God is not gonna approve of me or love me. Where moral beliefs are violated, it can rupture the core belief about who you are, going back to that cognitive belief, belief of others that you're supposed to trust or that you're trusting God. So remember that a part of the basic training in military culture is emotional control, right? So MST can leave you feeling not in control. So I'm gonna show you this brief clip and I'm gonna say if there's anyone here that has experienced uh, sexual trauma where this might trigger you, it's okay to just pause, um, not pause, but mute or walk away for a second. Is self-care important? It's important. Everything changed the, the day that I was raped. He hit me in the head and knocked me out. I remember holding the closet thinking, what just happened? A month later, I found out I was pregnant. If this is happening to me, surely I'm not the only one. Sixteen thousand one hundred and fifty service members were assaulted in 2009. About half a million women have now been sexually assaulted in the U.S. military. They let this man get away with everything but murder. They gave him Military Professional of the Year Award during the uh, rape investigation. They made it very, very clear if I said anything, they were going to kill me. Most Americans assume that there is access to a system of justice. You would think that because the military is about protecting our country, that certainly they would want to protect their own. We're a country who needs every good soldier to make sure we have a strong military defense. How many women are leaving the military because they've been sexually assaulted or raped? Civilians see it as being a military problem. Most rapists are repetitive criminals. They do it again and again. They go on to literally prey on women and men, girls and boys in our neighborhoods back home. When does this ever end? 
It's very difficult to do a story on the most powerful institution in the world. The Department of Defense has a history of covering up sexual offense problems. I don't know who you think elected you to defy the Congress of the United States. What is it you're trying to hide? So let's talk about it. So these per the VA or descriptions of what sexual assault or harassment are, being physically forced to have sex, someone having sex, sexual contact with you without your consent, such as when you're asleep or intoxicated, repeated comments about your body or sexual activities, because the one time isn't enough, that has to be repeated, and threatening and unwanted sexual advances. And it goes on in terms of um, describing sexual harassment as well. So now let's talk about the data with sexual assault. So here is a graph, this is from 2018, and I wanna stress that this is reported um, uh, sexual assault that happens. And men as well as females can be victims of sexual assault and harassment. Um, it's just more prevalent in with females. So you have the 0.7 compared to the 6.2 for females that have um, reported sexual assault. This was in 2018. Now this next graph we're gonna focus on for a while. It's important to note this line. What is something that you notice about this line? You can't answer, but so for, for, for what I see and what's bothering to me is if you can say there's no dip in the line. So this started in 2008. These reports of sexual assault have just gone up and up increasingly. There's, there's a big jump in uh, 2012, it looks like, and then a plateau in 2014 or 2016, but there's no sense of, of a decrease, right? So it looks like we're on a trajectory for this to continue to be an issue in the military with sexual assault. But I mentioned about report. So you see the plateau from um, 2014 to 2016. So let's talk about what happened there. So during that time, there was a big focus on um, military rape, sexual trauma and harassment, especially with that jump that happened in 2012. So in 2012, the department, or I should say the Pentagon did a survey. So this isn't reported. Report is, you know, a tracked document report of sexual trauma versus a survey. 2012 Pentagon did a survey and found that 26,000 men and women reported being assaulted. But of that 26,000, only 3,374 reported it. So I'm not a mathematician, but I know a huge gap when I see one. You go from 26,000 that have experience versus less than 4,000 that actually reported it. We're gonna talk possibly why that is. So there's the plateau. I mentioned there was a spotlight on, on the military in this issue. If, you, if anyone remembers, it was in the news um, for quite a while um, about these assaults. So in 2013, the commander in chief at the time, the president at the time, he signed into law the NDAA, which is essentially, um, it amends the Department of Defense sexual assault and harassment policies. And he told the military, essentially, you have one year to get it together. And so that's like where you, the, one of the reasons for this plateau that you see during that time. But let's go back to that 26,000 um, actual versus reported. So going back to the reported, 43% said in reporting the assault, my experience was negative. And then you had 21% that said, not only was my experience negative, I was met with people trying to deter me from pushing this further or from reporting it. So from being sexual assault from the Atlanta MST, you can receive benefits, not from the act itself, but from um, the conditions that occurred because of it. So any the trauma that has the conditions that um, happened because of the, the assault. To help support your claim, um, these are some of the forms that you can, you can provide to the Department of Justice, the harassment reporting forms and the um, investigative reporting um, service forms. But I wanna stress, let me go back. I wanna stress that 
in order to receive benefits, you don't have to report at the time of the incident of the assault, and you don't necessarily have to have these proofs, these documentations. Um, these are just helpful, but it's not necessary. To report, each VA has an MST coordinator. Um, you can receive MST-related care outside of a medical uh, setting, such as a community vet center, and you don't need to have necessarily have service-connected disability rating. When I say disability, uh, uh, disability rating, when you hear veterans say, I'm 30%, I'm 90%, that's basically how much um, disability money that they receive. So yeah, the 26,000 that said I've been assaulted, but only less than 4,000 reported. So what are some reasons why someone would not report, and we'll focus on females for the, for the sake of this presentation, why are some reasons why you would not report it if you've been assaulted, if you've been raped? There's a couple of things that can happen. One is retaliation is big in the military for reporting it. There's the, the risk that you, you risk of hindering your promotion. And then there's the isolation that happens. What happens if the person that assaulted you was your direct commanding officer? Then who do you report to them? Those are some aspects, but then there's the bigger one that we have to look at is the military culture is very much male dominated and still is. You look at the commercials that we have for veterans, look at the ceremonies of honor that, that occur. There are some commercials that, that do sponsor or show female veterans, but it's predominantly males. Even wounded soldiers or wounded um, veterans, it's, you see stories of male veterans more often than you do female veterans. Even though females have been a part of the military since the beginning of time, but yet it's still a very male dominated system. I'm gonna tell you also a story for one of the female, the female veterans that I've worked with. She, this is related to the VA, uh, Philadelphia VA and nothing against the Philadelphia, they have great resources, but it's more the culture of people that go there. Um, she says the moment that I, my foot hits the ground on my car, I get cat calls in the comments. And I tell the story, which is true. I've gone to the VA before once. I had my collar on, I was walking in and this gentleman told, had an inappropriate comment towards me. And I turned around and he saw my collar and he says, I'm sorry, I didn't know that you were a reverend. And I said, it doesn't matter if I'm a reverend or not, that, that comment was inappropriate, but that's just the culture of, you know, it's okay to say those things and treat females like that. And it's not. Let's get into the family impact um, that it has. So we talk about military culture. We talked about the moral injury and what happens to a veteran, this internal um, battle with the conscience that happens, the battle of the norms, the norms and virtues of the military versus the norms that they went into the military with. But then when you come home, there's the family impact. Divorce rate amongst veterans is high. It still is very much high. So for the therapists and social workers that are on here, I'm sure you know what this diagram is. It's the hierarchy of needs. It's a theory that says that for a healthy adult, adult um, you have to have stability in each of these areas to reach the tip, top of that, which is the self-actualization. When I work with female veterans, especially during the retreats, I show this because a lot of them don't understand the effects it has, especially if they have children, and some of them recognize as children themselves of, of, of veterans, the effects it has on their children and then when their children grow up, right? Before we go into it, it's important to know that not all veterans or service members go into the military because they want to serve the country. Some of them go into for other reasons. They see it as a way out. They see it as a a way to prove themselves to someone, maybe if they come from a strong military background or just a way they see to better themselves. But what happens when you go into the military and these, uh, these levels have holes in them, they're unsteady, you know, the sense of love and belonging, the sense of faith, of safety. And then you go into the military and then you experience trauma. So you add another layer to that. And then you get out of the military and you go home and you have kids, what happens to that? What does this pyramid look like for your children? So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. There's the conscious teaching and the unconscious programming that happens, right? So when trauma happens for a parent, um, 
and it's not addressed or, or processed, it can have emotional, developmental, behavioral, interpersonal, and cognitive effects on the children. A lot of the female veterans feel, you know, I pay attention to my kid, you know, this is an issue, but understand children are sponges. They absorb the nonverbals as well. They see how you interact with people. They see how you cope with things and how, what your relationships are like and how you define them. And they absorb that. So it could be the parent struggles to, with proper coping mechanisms, which makes it difficult for the child to express emotion. Or the parent could model inappropriate coping skills, be emotionally numb, and then they have trouble bonding or attaching with their child or avoiding situations. And then there's sometimes the children, as you know, take on adult roles, which they're not supposed to do. And that can cause disruptive behaviors in the schools that you see. You have kids along that lines that might mimic the parents behaviors because they want to feel more attached to them and feel like you know they're wanted or belong if i if i experience the same thing that you are maybe you'll love me more and it impacts future relationships the whole emotional cutoff is very much real so with veterans that have trauma especially moral injury there's the habit of emotionally cutting off anything that triggers you know avoiding places people or things that cut off but for kids, if they pick up that, that way of coping, sometimes that person that's cut off is you. So giving you an example, I had an event where it was for homeless veterans and our diocese had a table where veterans can come and just receive prayer, whatever the case may be. And there was one particular veteran that asked for prayer for her son. And she says, I haven't spoken to my son in 10 years, cut off. That's what they know. If something triggers, I cut it off. So it's important to work with female, especially uh, female veterans and understanding what they're going through and the effects that it might have on their family and their kids. So the answer is up, but I pay attention to my kid. What's the problem? Remember the nonverbals, what they're seeing, how you interact and how you cope with things. The spiritual versus the clinical model, we talked about the PTSD versus moral injury and that initiative that the VA had of having therapists and chaplains come together to discuss, um, discuss moral injury and address it. So one thing before we start is acknowledging that all if not most, I believe all assessments or biological biopsychosocial evaluations or assessment, there's at least one question or a whole section that asks about spirituality, right? But for some reason, how often is the answers to that or that topic explored within the treatment plan or explored period within working with the individual? Why is that? So there's some con uh, misconceptions. One might be your own biases. So you as the provider, social work, whatever the case may be, even lawyer or therapist, if you are not spiritually connect, connected or atheist, and that's not comfortable for you, and so therefore you don't explore that with your client, that could be a reason. And then the spirituality versus religion. Everyone, some people think that religion equals spirituality, and that's not necessarily the truth. Or if I talk about it, I'll get in trouble. You're not supposed to talk about religion. It's a no-no. Or the cultural incompetence. Those are all some reasons why. So we're going to debunk that. All right, so you have the clinical model versus the spiritual model. And the major differences is the way that we look at moral injury. With the clinical model, it's something to be treated, right? It's abnormal. This guilt, this shame, this sadness, it's an illness. It's a disorder that we should treat. Versus in the spiritual model, it's different. We integrate and we journey with. Human suffering is considered normal in the spiritual framework. Um, finding meaning amidst, amid suffering and nurture hope to overcome despair. So in the spiritual framework in the community, we offer spiritual disciplines and practice to nurture reconciliation and, re and, and restoration. Suffering is considered just a part of life. You know, we're told over and over again, this life brings tribulation. So as a disclaimer, I'm speaking from the Christian aspect. I mean, there's a lot of denominations that have their own views of, of how this is perceived, but I can only speak to, to what I know. And as a faith community, we have the concept of struggling together, you know, carry each other's burdens is big with us. You know, the prayer teams, um, confessions, sermons, testimonies, all those things. 
I say this not to say our goal is to suffer, but we just consider suffering as normal. So I don't want you to think that we seek out to suffer. That's just not the case. And these are just some of a scripture that relates to how suffering is a part of life and how we lean into it as an opportunity to heal and hope versus something that we have to just treat. Now this next clip I'm gonna show you, I love this clip. It's what I use when I have veteran, female veteran retreats. It helps shows this concept of healing versus just trying to get rid of or treat, how we engage in moral injury and how we heal it. Guys, ready? There we go. There is a story, usually attributed to the Native American tradition, which illuminates different ways of paying attention. An elder, talking to a child, says, I have two wolves fighting in my heart. One wolf is fearful, vengeful, envious, resentful, and deceitful. The other wolf is compassionate, loving, generous, truthful, and peaceful. The child asks, which wolf will win the fight? The elder responds, the one I feed. That doesn't mean we try to deny or hurt or kill the angry wolf. If we did that, we'd end up in a long battle, all the while somehow making that wolf more powerful through our hostility and fear. Hating that wolf sucks the strength right out of us. Instead, we calmly pay attention to the angry wolf and let go of believing they have the answers. If we can do that, they end up lying down next to us, no longer an enemy. We help strengthen the kind and loving wolf, giving it nourishment and support so that we can follow it. That peaceful wolf can become our steady companion and show us the way through all kinds of different life experiences. Restful or chaotic, enjoyable or disappointing experiences may come and go, but we can have a guide with us through it all. This is what mindfulness can help you do. Mindfulness allows us to see our thoughts and feelings as they are beginning. It's very powerful to know what we're feeling as we're feeling it, know what we're thinking as we're thinking it. With mindfulness, we can choose what will strengthen and bring into action, and we can choose what we will gently let go of. We don't have to be at the mercy of old habits or old ways of thinking or old ways of being. We are empowered. It just takes practice. I love that video. And it's, it's helpful for the veterans that we work with to help them visualize. If you notice that angry wolf, we're not trying to get rid of it, kill it, throw it in the river, set it on fire. It's we have to nurture hope. You know, that happy wolf is nurturing that and allow our past is the past. It's a part of our life. But how do we heal from that? And that's a part of the moral injury. So now let's get into, we talked about understanding military culture. We just talked about what moral injury is in relation to PTSD, what it feels like um, to walk around with moral injury, the symptoms, how it affects our family. So now what do we do about that? And the answer is there's moral injury programs on different levels. But going back to that spiritual model, it's important to keep this in mind. It's healing focus versus something is wrong with me. It's not a disorder. It's a response to my natural conscience and moral compass being tampered with. It's a natural response. So I mentioned this briefly in the beginning. The first one is community clergy. This is how we had developed this really meaningful relationship with the, the Michael J. Crescent's uh, Philly VA. Um, these clergy trainings are led by my good friend and chaplain on tall, Chris on tall, who's created a lot of publications surrounding the moral injury program that he created, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So during this community clergy train, it's all clergy of different, whether it's priests, deacons, whatever the case may be. And the purpose is to help clergy be better prepared for providing pastoral care to veterans. Remember that religious letters, are, religious leaders are often the first um, that veterans turn to for help, right? We don't diagnose, we're not here to judge, we're just here to tend to whatever your pain and your suffering is. Attending to pain and suffering is literally in our vows as clergy. There's four modules to this, military culture, 
culture, pastoral care, mental health services, building community partnership and the healing ceremony, which I'm excited to talk to you about. Some other things that you can do or that we do to the left is the Philadelphia stand down. That's that table I was talking about where it's a tables for uh, you know, people providing services, whether it's for housing, counseling, whatever the case may be. Our diocese always has a table strictly for prayer. That's it. That's all that we offer. And I have to tell you through the hundreds of veterans that come to our table, close to 0% ever ask for prayers for our utilities or housing or those physiological needs. It's, I haven't spoken to my son in 10 years. Um, I don't have a good relationship with so-and-so. They're all about emotion and relationships. The other picture is our um, veterans mass. It's an opportunity for veterans to submit their prayer requests, to ask for reconciliation. They can attend these masses and ask for direct um, prayer and forgiveness as well, or healing, a healing prayer. And then we have the female retreats. This is a building, of course, that we don't take pictures of the females for their privacy, um, but we have it twice a year. And the next one is in July. There's a day one and there's one for the weekend. The purpose of these retreats is to give female veterans a space, a safe space to be together. Uh, the criteria is that they all have MST and moral injury. So it's females coming together to share their stories if they want to, but also predominantly to learn about what they're experiencing. Some female veterans don't understand what they experience is trauma. What they went through is military sexual trauma. Um, and that they have moral injury. So when they see it, like when I said, I read the definition of moral injury and there were some veterans that started to get teary-eyed, it's relieving to put a label on what you've been feeling or experiencing because it doesn't match with PTSD. Like I said, you can't put a pill or prescription for your conscience. And these are just the objectives of, of the retreat. Um, is to seek, to seek and express ourselves in constructive ways, address military sexual trauma and the unspoken and unaddressed wounds caused as a result of it. We go over spiritual health as well. The religion, which is defined as, you know, the practices that happen, uh, the text is about the rituals versus spirituality is more about the relationship that it happens. I'm gonna skip this and it's a cute video, but I think we'll go to the next one. What's important to talk about before I go to this one is um, with these retreats, it's a retreat. So you don't wanna talk just about, you know, what the symptoms are and that things, but you wanna give them tools to heal and just feel like, um, just feel like they can be loved and, and tools for self-care. We mentioned about MST, how you feel that your body has been violated and therefore you feel tainted, you feel ugly, you feel like this is something that God wouldn't love and how you deal with that. You feel disconnected with your body. So it's a way to reintroduce them feeling comfortable with that. So I'm going to talk about two major programs that are moral injury programs that specifically are um, to address moral injury. I'm not going to say treat because we don't treat. Um, moral injury. One is the BSS, the Building Spiritual Strength. This is done, I know for sure, at the VA in Rhode Island because the chaplain I used to work with moved to the VA in Rhode Island, and this is what she um, she practices with female veterans that have MST and moral injury. So there's eight sessions. You know, you go from building a rapport. I'm not going to read all of this. Building a rapport, um, and then you go into resolving conflicts understanding what theology, having that talk about theology. And then it goes into more active things like addressing active versus avoidant, addressing forgiveness, which is huge. We wanna make sure that we talk about forgiveness and healing. And then the last session, which is the self-evaluation um, of progress and individual spiritual goals. The other one is the moral injury group. This is the one that Chaplin and Tall with the VA here leads, um, it, which is amazing. It's being nationally known. And as I said, he's done a lot of publications. So this is a moral injury ceremony at one of our churches because when it happens at the VA, we don't take pictures. So this is the Bishop and I, and this is um, the end. Those are candles of hope, which I'll explain in a minute. So the elements of this moral injury group and ceremony is um, the strength-based prophetic voice and the, the community healing ceremony, right? The objective being to 
um, enhanced functioning and self-compassion. Veterans share their experiences. They emphasize the ownership of warfare does not just lay on their shoulders. Remember that social contract I talked about, but it's the ownership of the community and the citizens as well as our elected officials. The strength base comes from helping veterans understand of a mentality of I have a weakness or a deficit moving towards self-awareness. What you're doing and, and experiencing is normal. It's a natural reaction to having a conscience for having it being tampered with. The prophetic voice, we say that they have a prophetic voice during this program. It means that we challenge the conscience of people in the community about taking greater responsibility and, and awareness. Remember we talked about the social disengagement you know, considering veterans a hero or, you know, considering they, they did it harm or just, um, or what you have is your problem, it's a disorder. We disengage. And so the three, um, the three levels of, of social disengagement that um, Antal talked about, and this is his publication, Transforming Veteran Identity Through Community Engagement, in case you wanna look for it. So he then identifies three categories. One is the projected demonization, blaming veterans. This is the Vietnam era. Um, projected valorization. This is, you know, considering veterans as hero. Here's a parade. Oh, your kids be joining the military. That's amazing. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. There's a book called Invisible Scars. And there's a Vietnam vet that compares people saying, thank you for your service to people saying, I'm sorry for your loss during a funeral meaning it's just a hollow statement without emotion. It's just something that we say as a reaction, that moral disengagement. The third one being pathologizing is it's your disorder. What you have is your problem. It's a disorder that should be fixed. And then when we as citizens morally disengage, it forces veterans to take a further steps back and back and feel isolated from the community. What I'm dealing with, my pain, my sorrow, my grief, my guilt, and my shame is for me to deal with because us as civilians aren't engaging with it. So the moral injury is a 12 week uh, program. It's, a not, it's 90 minutes and it goes through the, these, um, these areas and it always, always ends with a ceremony, a healing ceremony. And I'm really excited to share this with you guys and talk about it because it's at the core of how we address moral injury. So we have a community healing ceremony and it goes back to that social contract. Remember the three parties, obligations on all parties. In the beginning, veterans feel might feel regard themselves as outcasts, no longer belonging to the community. Remember the transformation that happens and now you're trying to re-engage into, into civilian community and what that feels like. And so the, the healing ceremony um, which is open to the public, by the way, as well as the family and friends of the veterans. It's um, acknowledging the burdensome knowledge, right? A mask our delusions with our voice of prophecy. I love that from Antal's, Antal's publication. Remember that quote versus you can't handle the truth. Well, we don't want to know the truth. And so during this ceremony, um, you have veterans that share their story. And sometimes they're extremely vivid about what happens. I've been to every single one since they've been doing them at the Philly VA. And I tell you, I never get emotionally numb to any of them. Myself and Chaplain Antal, who was a chaplain in the army himself, always become emotional at some point. But once a veteran shares a story and they're so vivid, it's almost like they're projecting a video of, you know, a standstill of what they experience. But afterwards, you don't clap. That's one of the house rules or show, um, make any type of comment. The purpose is to lean into that uncomfortableness of hearing this traumatic story. And then there's this portion, which is beautiful. It's two circles. Veterans form a circle outside of civilians that have a circle on the inside. So it's outside veterans, inside civilians. And it symbolizes veterans protecting us as the community, right? And then as halfway through the ceremony, that circle switches that obligation on both parts. So civilians now are on the outside with this veterans on the inside signifying us protecting the veterans to welcome them home. And then there's candles of lament where veterans or people in the community light a candle to signify a death that occurred um, of someone, whether it's a soldier, a, a service member or someone that they've 
killed during their, their combat or whatever the case may be. And those candles turn into candles of hope. I'm gonna share with you, this is from Antal's publication. And it says, his name is Andy. And I was here for his, um, his sharing of his story, which is very strong. So I'm gonna share it with you. It's a brief paragraph of what he shared with us, which is in this publication. It says, I took into the leveled shell of this home to see no targets. I see instead the wasted bodies of 19 men, eight women, nine children. A half singed Minnie Mouse doll mirrors the lifeless of a six-year-old girl holding it. Most of the bodies were slumped together in a pile, woman in a protective ring over the children, the children mostly under the women. This pile was paralyzing, like they would arise to exact revenge. I could not stomach handling these bodies long enough to discover my intended target. I was defeated by my own hypocrisy, the shame of my unholy perpetration. My targets were proud Iraqis in an occupied state, bakers, merchants, cousins, priests, mothers and fathers, big brothers and baby sisters. I relived this alone, the steel cylinder heavy with a 38, knowing that to drive one into my own face will free me from this prison. These sights and smells to obscure this truth were only ensure it happens again. I confess to you this reality and hope of redemption that we might all wince and marvel at the true cost of war. So after he got that, and by the way, myself and Chaplain and Tal were just the, the tears because it was like he was reliving it. And so there's the candles that were meant. And so at the end of it, he's holding this tray with these lit candles of the 36 people were, whose lives were lost at his hand. And he was so worried that no one would want these candles. So the, uh, the purpose is at the end of the ceremony, people on the audience, they take one of these candles as a candle of hope. And so he had this tray of these 36 candles and one by one people in the audience took each one until his tray was empty. And at the end, Andy just broke down crying because he didn't think anyone would want his candles. He didn't think anyone would want to share his burdens. And I wanna share with you, I took it very seriously. The candle that I had, he, he gave these people so much life that he was carrying burden for, for, for taking their life to the point where I found myself talking to the candle as if it was a real person. He gave them meaning, he gave them life through sharing their stories with the civilians and us taking ownership of that through these candles of hope. It was a beautiful ceremony. At the end of each ceremony, um, there's a hand cleansing ritual. So it's just pouring, which is, which is also common within faith, um, faith community. And so at the end, I wanna urge the transition from thank you for your service and what that term means to welcome home. So that's my challenge for everyone here is to change that thinking and to change that response when we see veterans and to acknowledge our part in warfare as taking some of that burdens of what it does to veterans themselves. Remember this social contract. Remember that we all take part in what happens. It's not the burden alone for veterans to have moral injury. So what can you do? Um, I don't want you to leave here thinking you can't do anything, but you can do a lot, especially if you have a family member that's a veteran, is make the effort to understand veteran culture, refer veterans and service members to moral injury programs. If you're a clergy or a pastoral minister yourself, you can do these community clergy workshops. Change the phrase to welcome home and take the standpoint of healing versus something is wrong with you. There's support groups if you're a family member, family are invited to these ceremonies, be patient. It's most important to have a conversation with everyone. So that is my time. These are some of the references. Um, this is my contact information. If you have questions, you wanna learn about the veterans retreats or moral injury programs or more about what moral injury is, I tried to boil, boil the ocean and, and discussing it. So I hope I did it justice for you. I really appreciate all of you taking your time out today to be here, to learn about moral injury, about veterans, and, and hopefully to take away what you can do to help that. Nancy? Thank you, Canon. It's my, I'm, um, I am overwhelmed. I am filled with so much emotion. Um, I have experienced some of this of having a father who was a veteran of having 
lived um, as what we were known as at the time as rugrats, the child of someone serving in the military and recognize uh, so much of what you're saying and wish I had known this when I was a child and could better understand um, and grow from that. And so I hope that today that people who are listening can um, think about that and how we can support our service members um, and their children. Um, that's my first thought. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that I have, because I'm not um, aware of where to find out the information about these ceremonies and when they take place, I've mm -hmm. never seen this information on the diocese website. I mean, how would we find out about that? Yeah, so what I can um, do, if anyone wants to reach out, I can start the, even a, a newsletter when this, the next one is coming up. Um, they were in person, but we have the past two have been virtual, but still just as effective um, as if they were they were in person. So they happen three times a year. So usually like the spring and then the fall and then early winter. So I'll share that with you, but please do contact me if you're interested in that. Thank you. I. Uh... I know we have it up, your information's here up on the screen, and I, I also put it in the chat for people. Um, yeah. I, I think that there's a question here that may not be directly in your domain, but there was a concern by um, one of our attendees about do men and women complete a psychological assessment prior to joining the military? I know the answer is yes. But is that something uh, that you'd want to speak to us more about? Well, I'm not sure if you just wanted the yes or no answer, if there was like a second part in terms of why why they were asking. But there, just like anything, there's assessment done. As clergy, we have a psychological assessment that, that mm -hmm. is done. Um, I don't know if that was referring back to the different reasons why no. some veterans or join the military or some civilians join the military. But um, I think... Um, to try to give it some context, I think you were going through at the time um, that post, that question kind of came through, you were going through the sexual assault and rape um, that happens in the military. Um, and I think um, that the panel, the attendee was asking um, about the psychological assessment due to the fact that that is so common, um, happens so much in, in the military and nothing seems to happen as a result. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's where that question kind of came from. Yeah, um, related to to that, that, that new law that was signed in in 2013 that I talked about, a part of the amendment was um, individuals that have a past of sexual assault, there's a bigger screening, so they are not allowed to enter the military as a way to to address that. So yes, there is assessment that is done um, when you enter the military. Uh, there's also a question here about from someone who is interested in the community clergy training. And so yeah. can they reach out to you to find out more about that? Please do. Okay. Yes, email me, call me, text me, send a courier pigeon, whatever you have to do. I'll be more than willing to, to share that with you. It's extremely important and they're really um, extremely beneficial. I'll, I'll just say that. And I'm not just saying that because I've been to them and I'm part of them, but. So the um, we'd like to, to know a little bit more about how you got involved with moral injury. Um, and anything that you would like to share in that area? Yeah, thank you for that, that question. So I'm gonna be honest with you in terms of my interest and passion with veterans, I really can't remember why I started. I am, um, my family does have members, a line of, of people that are in the military, you know, uncles, cousins, that type of thing. Um, I really do feel like this is something that was just brought into my path and it's just become a passion of a passion of mine. A part of it could be, you know, I have 
an uncle in terms of the family dynamic. He was always considered, I don't want to say the black sheep, but he was like the fun loving uncle. But just looking back at the dynamics of how he connected with my dad and our siblings, um, I know now a part of that is his own trauma. He is not one to show emotions. Um, and a lot of that I see in this presentation of what I know about moral injury and trauma for veterans, I now can reflect back in terms of of my uncle and build a better relationship with him. Um, so that's, I, I wouldn't say I started in this field necessarily because of my, my own family, like my father wasn't in the military, but it truly was just something that it fell in my path and I just, I ran with it and I fell in love with it by starting the veterans committee within the church when I was before I was ordained and to starting the veterans commission for the diocese, which has really expanded. It's important for veterans because they have the highest rate of suicide. There's no reason why we can't do something about that. And so this moral injury program, the more platforms I have to talk about it. So I thank you, Nancy, for the invitation. I'm going to grab it if we can get that out there of helping not just us as civilians, but veterans understand, you know, it's not your burden alone to walk around with. You don't have to walk around in plain sight, as I said, carrying this grief, the shame, and the guilt. Mm -hmm. Jamal, did I, I miss anything from one of the other? Um, any questions that I missed? You're good at catching them. In the chat? No, I think we're good so far. Okay. Um, another question that I, I, I see some comments and that I would put together several questions to say, this is hard. This is um, to agree to help someone carry this incredibly painful misery. Um, and, and, and how, how do you do that? It's, it's helpful in terms of, we talked about the spiritual framework, is that, you know, our call is to journey with and address the pain in the world and the suffering. It's just embedded into not just our vows, but just how we live. And so if we see someone, our brother or sister in Christ, that suffering or going through this, such as our veterans, is, you know, my own personal, I don't want to say feelings, but empathy. It's more important that I walk with the person and journey with than to make it more self-involved and how I feeling and how bad this makes me feel. And I don't want to touch it. Like we said, you know, you can't handle the truth. You don't want to know the truth. The fact of the matter is you can't help someone address something and help them through their suffering if you don't lean into it and if you don't share it with them and if you don't even lean into the uncomfortable feelings of it. So to answer your question, I wanna be honest, it's not like I'm emotionally cold. You know, like I said, during these healing ceremonies when veterans share their story, they're so visit, I still break down. But the fact of the matter, it's not about me. The purpose is to help this individual, this human being understand that I hear you, I see you, I'll walk with you. You're not damaged, you're not, you don't have a disorder. This is a natural reaction that's, ha that's happening. You don't have to go through this alone. You know, we were never created, not to get spiritual, but I, I'm clergy, so I have to. We never created to, to be alone and just to kind of suffer on our own, just stay in our houses and deal with your own stuff. It's you know, there's too many people with resources and skills and empathy to allow that to happen. Thank you for that. And I hear what you're saying, and, and I know you're coming from the position um, of the of our religion. Um, but I also hear what you're saying is is a lot of what we're hearing in these uh, in this speaker series about trauma and children and how mm -hmm. important it is to stop. It has nothing to do with me. It's about that person, that child, and to listen, to truly listen, mm -hmm. and to not think that you have all the answers. Yes. Uh, and I, that's one of the, if I've learned something um, in this speaker series, that would be one of uh, the things that I've learned. And I would see it applying here. 
Yeah, thank you for that, Nancy. I mean, that connects with one of the house rules I talked about with the moral injury ceremony is, you know, when a veteran is done telling his truth, his story, his experience, is to just sit in silence versus respond. The notion is you listen to understand, not to under, not to respond, right? And, that, and that's what it applies here. So thank you for that. Uh, we've had a few questions about the welcome home Mm -hmm. um, and about how it's been received or uh, why you found it to be a better response? So it's not me. This is coming from veterans themselves. You'll hear during these healing ceremonies quite a few that would prefer the welcome home or um, a variation of that versus thank you for the service. And the explanation being is thank you for the service, especially for someone that has been, let's say has been through combat and has had to take a life. You're essentially saying, thank you for taking another person's life on my behalf. And then when you say that, it's just a reminder of what they've done. So I don't wanna say that's gonna be rejected. I don't think I've ever saw a veteran that just kind of responded negative, negative, but just to understand that phrase and how it's interpreted with a lot of, of veterans versus the welcome home. It goes back to, remember that um, emotional um, cycle of deployment right. that happens is you're going from norms to norms back and forth and then you come home you know you go from an environment where you had a role and function back to a home where you know you had your own norms and you're trying to fit in but your roles and function have changed so you're kind of just in this you know gray space between your military family and your your civilian family so welcome home is a basically a way of showing veterans we accept you for the way that you are, your experiences, how you're feeling, your emotional transformations. You don't have to hide that. Let us embrace that. So welcome home as you are. Thank you. Does that make sense? It does to me. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm yelling at you guys, but I get excited <laughs> about this stuff. So I talk loud and fast. I'm like, it's, it's, it's let me tell you funny. more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question in the chat. Uh, what avenues would you recommend for addressing moral injuries for those who resist the religious or sp spiritual dynamic? So you have to remember for moral injury, the core of it is that transgression against your moral beliefs. Um, so I will say there are, um, one of the requirements for the moral injury is to experience that is, um, a transgression against your moral beliefs. It's not necessarily related to a specific denomination, but there are some veterans that are involved where they're just, they're not there yet in terms of being connected with spiritual, with um, religion. So like if we have a prayer circle, they won't, they won't be included within, re included in that. So these moral injuries, it's not necessarily about a denomination necessarily. It's more about your feeling of transgression against your moral beliefs moral beliefs. Spirituality is just, um, it's a big part of that just because of the framework that we that we work with. And typically moral beliefs is associated with soul, which is why we say wounds to the wounds to the soul, invisible wounds of the soul. Um, so it's a heavy reference to that. I would say if you're an atheist, it might be a little bit you know difficult if you just don't want to hear anything about spirituality just because of that connection. But um, I would still refer veterans to this moral injury group for that reason of just being able to identify what you're experiencing and why um, and do some ex self exploration. You know, you might not feel that you're necessarily religious or, or spiritual, but as you're talking about it, you might tap into something that you didn't tap into before. Does that answer your question or their question? Um, there's an interesting question here from Maria and, um, and we're talking about moral injury, mm -hmm. um, as it pertains to racial issues and, um, are you focus on the veteran population? Is it safe to say that moral injury affects many other populations and we can utilize the same framework you have discussed? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I mentioned I want to hit it home. The focus is on veterans today and moral injuries just because 
you know, that's my background, my experience. And when we talk about moral injury in the community, it's usually related to veterans, just like PTSD. You know, non-military can, folk can experience or have uh, PTSD, the same as for moral injury. Um, the systemic racism, you know, like I think I mentioned judges, the court system, or, you know, social justice, people, the political people that are uh, been on the receiving end of injustices can experience moral injury as well. Think of it as, um, not that it's comparable, like people that have been assaulted, they're on the receiving end of this. And so what that's what was done was a violation of their moral beliefs, what they know to believe, you know, a breaking of trust and um, of their compass. So with racial injustice, if you're on the receiving end of like a hate crime, it's the same, it's the same. It's been, it's a violation of your moral compass, of your moral beliefs. A human being hating a human being to the point they want to cause harm to or do cause harm to and the effects of that and how you internalize that and how you relate that to your conscience and your moral values. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we've run out of time. And what I would like to say is um, I would suggest for anybody who's interested in being a part of this, learning more, um, that uh, that Reverend Smythe will get back to you. I know this for a fact. And, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and and I uh, wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to prepare this information for us, to give us an opportunity to look at one of the mental health issues um, that so many of us are dealing with personally or in our work um, from a different perspective. Um, with a different eye, um, eye, eye view um, and help us to open ourselves up to more possibilities um, of where there might be solutions, resources, and additions to our systems of care. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity, Nancy. Thank you, Jamal, um, for what you've done. And thank you to the audience, those that are that are still here and took time out of your your Thursday for this. I really appreciate you and I hope that you had um, take away some good points from this as well. So Jamal, are we ready to, there he goes. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So thank you Reverend Smythe um, for your presentation. Um, our next presentation will be April 22nd, 2021, starting at 2.30, presented by Diane Wagonhalls and Sandra Bloom. And the topic is, what's the big deal about trauma? We look forward to seeing you all then. Until then, stay well, be safe, and we'll see you later. Bye.